Casey Gray here from The Conscious Builder, and what you're about to watch is a recording from the Q&A session that I did with Chris Ballard, who is the CEO of Passive House Canada. In this Q&A session, I talk about the importance of team, my experience with Passive House, as well as the upcoming trades training that they're doing through Passive House Canada. So enjoy this short video on the Q&A session. Uh Casey, I do follow you and I, I love the stuff you've been doing. Uh, my question really, I have a couple of questions and maybe it'll dovetail onto it, is um, what's the biggest lessons learned as you're going from concept to completion? And then to add on to that, how hard has it been with your trades to get them on site to build Passive House? And what are the biggest the biggest hurdles that you've had to overcome? Thank you, great, uh, great show so far. Yeah. No problem. Uh, well, thanks for following us. I appreciate that. Um, it's those are the little things knowing that there's people out there that are interested in it makes us keeps us going. Right. So really appreciate that. Uh, the, I think well, nowadays the world has changed recently. So the biggest thing that we're dealing with right now is making sure that we have decisions ahead of time so that we can get ahead of the curve, right? We, we can't use certain materials on some projects because we can't get the product quick enough anymore, right? So we're dealing with delays. So unless a client wants to delay a project for an extended period of time, uh, and then we might not have work because everything's getting delayed, that'd be number one. So now we've created processes that we're like, we need all of these decisions before we start. We can't make decisions on the fly anymore. That, that, that's, the, that's the number one thing that we have to change now. So when you're starting with the concept to finish is we need to have everything sorted out up front, like choose your toilets, choose your faucets. Like we need all of those things too, because there's no, we'll just get it on site. If we have room, we'll get it to site. If not, we'll figure it out. We'll get it ordered. We'll bug them to just stay or store it in their warehouse as long as they possibly can. And then we'll take it, right? So that, that would be the number one thing that I'd recommend people do now. Um, Cause like I said, we're waiting for three, four months for siding and people are getting upset with us, right? And we can't do anything about it. Um, the, sorry, I forget the second part to your question. Getting your trades on side, what's right. been the biggest hurdle? Yeah, um, we didn't really have, a, like I have a long standing relationship with a lot of the trades, that, the big trades. Usually what happens is that we get a little pushback and they don't get it. And so you kind of make some jokes with them. I, I always remember my, my wife has her master's in clinical psychology. And when she was going through her school, uh, I'm like, oh, I won't need to know that stuff. Who cares? That's like, that's all I do now, right? Is, is just understand people and, and work with people. And, and especially as a contractor, you need to basically be able to go on site and meet people where they're at sometimes. If they're angry, sure, be angry back at them. If they're more, like be more passive, right? So you need to be able to kind of shift your mood. But uh, the biggest thing with trade, trades are usually rough around the edges, right? So I can work with them on site. You make some jokes, you, you tell them like, look, you just explain why this is why uh, this is what we have to do. But what happens after they've done it once, they're proud of it. Then they can say, I was a part of that build. I did that build. Like we're doing a 160 year old home right now. They're everyone, like other trades are coming be like, oh yeah, my friend was here and he was working on the project. I've been friends with him for years. And like, they're, they're talking about it, right? So that's, it's that little momentum that speeds up. So once you've, once they've done it once, you know, everyone made fun of me for wearing Birkenstocks when I built my passive house. Uh, eight years ago, like, was with or without me. socks is the question. Yeah. I've never even owned Birkenstocks. That's the funny thing, right? So <laughs> <laughs> uh, but but now everyone's proud to be a part of it to be a part of that project right and and i think that's that's where the culture and then they start to realize it's for more than just a paycheck right it's not just trying to get in and out quickly it's to actually do a project and be proud of it that's a whole different thing that's something that uh that you, you just, once again you have to experience right there was a third question harvey i think you had or maybe it's been answered i probably had a I had a couple more um uh, you know what, I think, I know Daniel Clark has a whole bunch of them. If I find mine again, I'll just raise my hand and can come back. Okay. Sorry, Chris, I just can't remember what the third one no, was. No, that's, that, that's quite all right. I, I, I wanted to comment on, uh, on what Casey was talking about in terms of trades. I know we do a lot of trades training and <clears throat> I like to talk to people about why are you here? Why are you taking the trades training? Um, and it's, it's wonderful to see uh, the, you know, trades people wanting to build better, wanting to have pride in, in what they're doing. Uh, and I have a number of, uh, of uh, architects and designers who tell me that uh, uh, when they go to do their first uh, air tightness test, that, uh, 
you know, everyone uh, is given the day off or whatever. Um, but suddenly a, a lot of tradespeople show up because they want to see how their work uh, stacks up and they're quite excited to see it. And it's almost a, a celebration of excellence, uh, you know, when the building performs well, uh, or if it doesn't perform as well, they're the first ones to try and figure out why it's not performing well. So uh, I don't think we give enough credit to uh, our tradespeople who are, uh, uh, you know, dedicated to excellence, uh, you know, uh, like the rest of us. So there's my, there's my pitch. So uh, another question, Deb. Yeah, um, question here from Daniel. Uh, how much of a challenge are the planning departments out east to satisfy and still do efficient design? In my, from, like I said, I don't typically deal with the, the permitting process, uh, but from what I've heard from the architects and designers we're working with, like Ottawa is notoriously difficult. Um, I know I can compare it to the project that we just did at Algonquin Highlands. We got our permit in less than 24 hours. Uh, the inspectors that come on site, he gets it. Like he'll come on site when, I, when I'm doing the work and he, he notices the attention to detail. And he's like, well, if you did that right, I know you're gonna do everything else right. Like he just, he got, he's like, the fact that you sealed the ceiling way up there and taped everything and did it properly. He's like, I know you're gonna get all the stuff down here. Right, so there's some common sense involved with it, which was which was interesting, and it was more like you were working with them as opposed to against them. So a lot of times here is like I said, everyone's just trying to protect themselves, and yeah, everyone's worried about getting in trouble, right? And yeah. uh, they forget that we're all working towards a, a common purpose. Yeah, and that's a really important lesson to take away. Another question, Deb. I uh, got a few questions here in regards to the clinical psychology. Ask your, your wife being a clinical psychologist and uh, some really good uh, intriguing questions regarding team dynamics, organizational culture and how important that is. Did you wanna touch base a little bit more on, on maybe some strategies that you have used in this area of your team? Yeah, so we actually have a really strict hiring process now. So before we bring anybody on, we do what's called the rule of three. We interview at least three people for every position, whatever it is. Uh, we interview them in three different locations. They get interviewed by three different people and we check at least three references. And if it's not a yes or hell yes for all three people who's interviewed them, then we don't hire them. But like I said, things have changed. Uh, we need to speed it up a little bit. So what we've decided to do recently is we're actually gonna reduce that to two interviews. We'll get it done within a day or two. And then I'm always the third one. So what I would do is because we always have a probational period anyways, I can go out during that probational period talk to the guys, see how things are going to talk to them uh, and make sure that everything's working. Cause what happens, we need to be very protective of our culture inside. Cause like I said, we're dealing with a lot of problems. So if our team isn't meshing, uh, then the other problems are just going to get worse. So we need to make sure that our team is working well together because it's never going to be perfect, right? Especially now we're dealing with delays and problems left, right, and center with all with stuff that's out of our control. And I, and I'm constantly reminding people like we're getting on call sometimes and we're arguing as a team, not because we're upset with each other, because we're just frustrated at what's happening. Right. And it's starting to come out. And I need to remind people that like, we're all on the same team. We're supporting each other. We'll get through this. Uh, this is what we're doing. What can we do right now to move forward? As long as you have people working together, uh, then you can get through anything. Great. Great. Thank you. Um, Harvey, you had another question here that queued up, you said. Yeah, that was the other the other question was my my shameless plug. I'm sure that uh, Chris will like it. And that is uh, what courses have you taken from Passive House and what courses have you taken from Passive House Canada? So I, I actually haven't done any courses because uh, I'm the, the hands on guy. Uh, that being said, I have been talking with them and there is uh, there. We were talking about which course. I don't know which course that we I was I was going to actually do, but um, I don't know. I the, the, the trades course, the yeah. Trades course. Trades yeah. course, yeah. So I yeah. haven't gone through the detail. Yeah, because I'm the hands on, like, we're just so busy. I'm definitely out there to just make things happen. I'm not one that also says that I know everything. I don't know how to do the calculations. I don't know how to figure out, uh, like, the orientation in terms of what, you know, if I add this overhang, how is it going to do? Like, those, that's part of the integrated design process. 
I'm the, I'm the builder. Um, we're good at building. That's what we do. We can seal up the building. We know what details, we know what works. We know what doesn't work. We've tried a bunch of different features, but I'm going to lean on the designer for some of the stuff. And I'm going to lean on the energy advisor for other things too. Right. And we all need to, I'm very much like, let's stay in our lane. Uh, it can veer out a little bit. I understand it all and I grasp it all, but I don't need to know how to do the calculations. I don't need to sit in front of my computer, to do it. I don't need to know how to do a blower door test. Although I just, did one for the first time yesterday uh, with, because the guy, Brian, who does all of our videos and all of our content, he used to work for HomeSol, who does all of our energy advising. So we borrowed a blower door test to, to do it, right? Just to speed things up. But, um, but and, 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 hopefully found, and hopefully found doing a blower door test uh, in a single family residence was, was not too, too difficult. Uh, <laughs> like a lot of passive house things. And I, I'm delighted that you're taking, uh, I, I think we've got you booked in in September for our trades course. So I'm, uh, I'm going to be interested to see uh, your take on, uh, on, on um, high performance building, on passive house building. Uh, when you've been through uh, a few days with uh, fellow builders, tradespeople, and uh, uh, some really great, uh, uh, some really great instructors who you know come from the the, the same background that you come from. Yeah, so I'm looking forward, forward to that. that. That's what I needed. I just needed this push to get it done because you know I've done training for other things to get our certifications for net zero and all of those things, right? But I've never yeah. had to do anything on the passive side. Well, this is it. And we'll, uh, uh, you know, in our discussions uh, uh, over the past several months, it was clear to me that you more than understood the fundamentals of building to net zero passive house. Uh, and, uh, you know, we're uh, again, our, our, our big job here at Passive House Canada is to convert as many people as possible to net zero buildings. Uh, and to uh, to lay out one pathway forward, which is uh, uh, through Passive House Canada. Happy to do the uh, the training to get people there, but you are more than well on your way. You're actually doing it, so all good to hear. Deb, what else do you have for us? Uh, another question here: a way to find building inspectors who know at least a bit about passive buildings, or is it just luck of the draw for who does the inspection? I think to some extent it's luck of the draw. However, what I've recently found out is that we can request a different inspector if, for example, one inspector is giving us a hard time for something. Um, so we usually, at least in our area, there's, depending on where you're building, you get a certain inspector. So there has been some inspectors that are better than others. So we'll know what we're getting into. But then again, now that there's a lot of younger people coming in, right? And people, moving around to different departments. So it's always changing. Uh, I know that you can reach out wherever you're building. You should be able to reach out to whoever their supervisor is if you're having issues and deal with them directly. Um, I also speak to my trades because they'll call, like our plumber will call for plumbing inspections all the time. So if we run into issues with plumbing, I call him and he'll deal with it, right? Because he's been doing it. He knows which inspectors work well for plumbing. Um, so th there's... Once again, it's all part of the team, right? And, and just making some phone calls and seeing who can help who. And I usually just don't give up till I get the answer I'm looking for. <laughs> and I would imagine too that that uh, as your company gets to be known within a municipality by a building inspectors, they get what you're doing. You know, you mentioned yeah. the building inspector who pointed out the uh, the attention to detail. Uh, yeah. When you go back and do another project there, you already have established that that credibility with them. Yeah, one thing that I find really helps is if you reach out to the inspector before the project mm -hmm. and you meet with them and say, look, this is what I'm going to do. This is why I'm doing it. Do you see any issues now that we should address? Because we obviously want to move. And then now, like I said, is more important than ever because you can't, we can't afford any more delays than we're already getting. So right. when you bring them involved right from the beginning, they usually respect that a lot more because then they have input. Right. They're just they're not just showing up and you built whatever you wanted. Maybe they're showing up and they bu you built it the way that they wanted to see it because it made sense and, and they agreed to it ahead of time. Yeah, good. We've got another question there, Deb. We're almost yes. out of time. Yes, we've got time for a couple more questions here. Okay. Uh, one question here is, uh, Casey, do you use double stud walls or sips in your buildings? Yeah, we've done both. So we've out of the passive homes that we've built, we've done double stud wall. We've both 
two different options. So one with the load bearing being on the inside, one with the load bearing being on the outside, uh, actually two with the, on the inside. We've also done uh, a prefabricated stud, kind of like a, a double stud that was kind of hanging the second stud, but it was a prefabricated like engineered wall truss. Uh, and then we've also done an ICF home uh, that was certified passive. So we've kind of done, tested all the options. <laughs> Um, so the only one we haven't done is prefab. Okay, great. Um, Harvey's asking Larson, um, sorry, Larson trusses. No, they are completely like engineered by this was for, I don't know if you're familiar with Mark Rosen, if you've heard of his house there, anyways, he put, he's the architect, right? So he put way more time into his own house than any homeowner could probably afford to pay him. <laughs> so he had engineered all these trusses that were manufactured just for his house. Glad you watched this video until the end. If you want to watch the entire interview, head to the Passive House Canada YouTube page. The link is in the description below. If you have any questions, any comments, please post them below and remember to live consciously.